The news and recent events in the United States at the moment is rather disheartening, scary, and uncertain. Yet, even in the midst of all this, small pockets of positive changes are occurring. Some that have been a long time coming, some that restore trust when little can be found. One such change has come to the forefront in some respects. A vote on change within Congress, the first one in nearly 30 years. This vote has not to do with reform, but the age-old statement that founded this nation so many years ago. Taxation without representation. Here, people have driven their eyes to, in an effort to see a guiding hand, and a scene of so much more. The scene of the federal government, the scene of the national treasures, the scene of the attack on Lafayette Square, and possibly the scene of the 51st state of the United States. Today, we'll be covering the District of Columbia, otherwise known as Washington, D.C., and its quest for statehood. The district was created in 1790 out of necessity. During the Revolutionary War, the seat of the National Congress changed many times, with Philadelphia being the first fixed location post-independence. However, this would not stay the case for long. In June of 1783, a mob of angry soldiers stormed the capital, demanding payment for their service during the war. Since Congress lacked the ability to have a standing army, protection landed at the feet of the states. Yet, Pennsylvania Governor John Dickinson was sympathetic to the soldiers' cause, and he refused to raise the militia to protect the National Congress. While this mutiny was eventually put down, the location of the Congress would shift a handful of times over the next few years, eventually coming back to Philadelphia in 1787, but one of the major effects from this was that Congress decided that it needed to create a federal district not reliant on any state's military protection. In comes the Residence Act of 1790, which created the District of Columbia, located on the banks of the Potomac River. This district would be created from land belonging to Maryland and Virginia, making the capital somewhat in the center of the nation. In the creation of this district, the National Congress gave themselves this power via the Constitution, in Article 1, Section 8, stating in quote, to exercise exclusive legislation in all cases whatsoever over such district not exceeding 10 square miles as may by concession of particular states and the acceptance of Congress become the seat of the government of the United States. And plus there's a bit more to it, but that's not important, at least not to me. Multiple states would offer up land for the creation of this district but eventually, the Potomac River was agreed on after a compromise over state debt, with a small section for Maryland and a smaller section from Virginia forming Washington, D.C. Yet, it wasn't exactly that simple. It's the federal government after all. It can never be that simple. George Washington requested that the city of Alexandria in Virginia be added to the federal district. Why did he want this to occur? Not 100% sure, but it just did. Uh, they did have a stipulation, though, that was added to the act that would prevent any federal buildings to be constructed on the southern side of the Potomac River. So even though Alexandria was added to the district, no federal buildings would be constructed in the city. And with the passage of the 1801 Organic Act, the citizens within the D.C. zone no longer had voting rights in their native states of Maryland or Virginia, and instead would be subject to federal oversight. A tad ironic considering the Revolutionary War basis, but that's neither here nor there. The treatment that D.C. and citizens received from the national government, who ended up having control over virtually all economic aspects of the district, uh, they were rather poor. Um, Congress lacked loyalty to the city's residents, and they were reluctant to provide support. During the War of 1812, and yes, that's the name of the war, were not that creative, British forces conducted an expedition in mid-August of 1814 that took and burned the capital city. 
routing the American militia at the Battle of Blainsburg, with the militia within the capital itself retreating without firing a single shot. Shortly after, President James Madison and Congress fled as well, watching DC burn as night fell. Most of the federal buildings, save the post office and the marine barracks, were burnt to the ground, and DC would need to be rebuilt. On the flip side of the river, the populace of Alexandria had long petitioned Congress to have them be excluded from the federal district, but it wasn't until the 1830s that such a thing really started to pick up support within the city. This was in part due to the general stagnation of the city in comparison to Georgetown on the flip side of the Potomac. There was also a fear that abolitionist forces would forbid slavery in DC, meaning that the main economic drive for Alexandria would be gone, and an increase of pro-slavery districts within the Virginian Assembly was desired, because at the time, they were on the verge of being tipped in the favor of anti-slavery members. From 1840 to 1846, the city petitioned Congress and the Virginian legislature to approve retrocession, with the latter finally agreeing in February of 1846, so long as Congress did as well. Congress would actually agree to this in July, and the city was added back into Virginia, with DC losing around a third of its size. During the Civil War, slavery would be outlawed within the district with the passing of the Compensated Emancipation Act. This act, passed in April of 1862, granted all slaves in DC freedom, with compensation being given to the slaveholders. Black individuals would be given $100 if they agreed to leave the United States and settle in either Haiti or Liberia, the latter which was a US colony at the time. Many freed black individuals would settle in DC after this bill, and in combination with a large garrison force for the duration of the war, would see the population grow rapidly, going from 75,000 in 1860 to around 130,000 in 1870. Even with the rapid growth of population, the area was still rather poorly maintained, having nothing more than dirt roads and extremely bad sanitation standards. In response to these poor conditions, Congress would pass the Organics Act of 1871, which revoked the individual charters of the cities of Washington and Georgetown, and they would create a new territorial government for the whole of the District of Columbia. The act provided for a governor appointed by the president, a legislative assembly with an upper house comprised of 11 appointed council members, and a 22-member house of delegates, which would be elected by residents of the district. It also created a board of public works that was in charge with modernizing the city. The governor appointed at the time installed a large amount of modernization improvements, yet he also bankrupted the entire city in the process, and this forced the federal government to remove all local institutions and have a three-member board appointed by the president oversee local operations. Segregation would be instilled in many federal institutions in the district in 1913 by President Woodrow Wilson, something that would hold until the 1950s. This would be changed in the 50s, largely due to President Harry Truman's removing the segregation in the armed forces and federal works places. That federal employees who have been guilty of misconduct are punished for it. The 1954 Boiling vs. Sharp Supreme Court case ended segregation within the public schooling in the district. And on March 29th of 1961, Congress would adopt the 23rd Amendment of the Constitution, this amendment granted DC electoral college votes in equal to the state with the lowest amount of EC votes. The reason for this was largely due to the growing civil rights movement in the 1950s, and DC was and still is a black majority, and it was a major harbor of the civil rights movement. On August 28th of 1963, Washington took center stage in the civil rights movement that had been brewing for a while, with the March on Washington and Martin Luther King Jr.'s I Have a Dream speech at the Lincoln Memorial. Of freedom and justice, I have a dream. 
When Dr. Keenan was assassinated in 1968, a large amount of riots occurred within DC. Um, there were a lot more reasons for the riots, such as extremely high unemployment for the black residents, deeply segregated housing, and the police being 80% white in a 67% black city. Yeah, do the math on that one. Uh, the assassination was just the major tipping point. Uh, and these riots pushed out a lot of businesses, and they encouraged more individuals to leave the city, creating a mass exodus of the population. This would see a gradual decline of DC's population over the years, going from a high of 805,000 people in 1960, all the way down to 572,000 in the year 2000. And even now, the number of DC residents has returned to pre-riot numbers. In 1973, Congress passed the District of Columbia Home Rule Act, ceding some of its power over the city to a new elected city council and mayor, with Walter Washington being the city's first elected mayor. In 1978, Congress sent the District of Columbia Voting Rights Amendment to the states for ratification. This amendment would have granted the district representation in the House, Senate, and Electoral College as if it were a state. The proposed amendment had a seven-year limit for ratification, and only 16 states ratified it in this period, meaning that it failed. Due to this failure, a push for statehood came from the district's population, with them drafting a constitution in 1982 and a second one five years later. And to this end, the district votes on who they elect as shadow representatives, consisting of one House member and two senators. These members are not recognized in Congress, and while they have the ability to vote in committees, they have no authority outside of there, nor can they propose their own bills outside of committees or propose amendments. DC statehood bills would get introduced in every single Congress since 1980, but only once did it get a vote on the House floor, with it being defeated in November of 1993, by a vote of 277 against to 153 for, even with then President Bill Clinton being vocally in favor of DC statehood. Would I work with them? Would I sign it if they did? I think the answer to that is yes. Is there ever any indication that that's about to happen? I think the answer to that is no. So that brings us to the present day, where just yesterday, June the 26th of 2020, the House of Representatives voted in favor of DC statehood for the first time ever in this nation's history. But then the question is, what's next? And the truth is honestly, absolutely nothing. Uh, the bill for a DC statehood would need to go to the Senate and get confirmed by the Senate. However, the current Senate Majority Leader, Mitch McConnell, has stated that he refuses to bring the bill to the Senate floor, equating statehood for DC as full bore socialism. Seriously, listen to this clip. Plan, uh, plan to, uh, to make the District of Columbia a state that given two new Democratic senators. So this is uh, full uh, bore socialism on the march in the House, and yeah, as long as I'm the majority leader of the Senate, none of that stuff is going anywhere. So it's obvious that so long as he's the majority leader, DC statehood is dead in the water. But outside of the political aspects, what other reasons are people against DC statehood for? Well, you normally hear for real objections, which I will list out here and counter to some degree. Now keep in mind, this will have some of my own personal biases in it, so take that into consideration. Firstly, people say that the federal government would have too much influence over the state, as the largest employer by far would be the federal government. Secondly, they say that the state has no rural population, and thus would only serve the interests of urban areas in Congress. Now the normal counter argument to this is that the Senate and even House of Representatives is slanted in favor of the less populated and rural states anyway as each state gets two senators no matter the size, and the House of Representatives has been capped at 435 members since 1929. In the Senate, a senator from Wyoming has 54 times the power per citizen than a senator from Texas has. Think of that, 
your vote is 54 times more powerful in Wyoming just because less people live there. And the same power advantage exists in the House of Reps, but to a much lesser scale. The third point is that DC is too small of a land area and too small of a population to be a state. For the population size, a, a 1830s congressional law set the required population to 60,000 for a territory to become a state, and currently DC has 12 times that number, and even has more population than two current states, with that number soon to be four states. Uh, and that number isn't going to go anywhere but up as time goes on. The population decline that was mentioned earlier in DC has reversed and DC is gaining a pretty decent amount of population per year now. And lastly, states cannot be formed from parts of other states. Now this one is interesting, as it is claiming that because DC was formed from land that belonged to Maryland in the long, long ago, that DC is still a part of Maryland, technically, kinda, sorta, maybe, and this may have been an okay argument if the residents of DC could vote in Maryland's elections, but they can't. Nor did uh, Maryland need to be consulted when an island in the Potomac, which was a part of the federal district, when it was given to Virginia in 1945. Now, there have been some suggestions and even bills in Congress that Maryland simply get the land back that it gave to the federal district, and the populace become a part of Maryland again. Yet, Maryland has said over and over that it doesn't want the land back. And the citizens of DC have instead opted for statehood, as shown in the 2016 referendum when 86% of the populace voted for statehood. So with all that information in mind, do you think that DC should be given statehood? Should the 700,000 voiceless Americans no longer need to scream taxation without representation? Say so down in the comments below on what you think of this matter. Hope you enjoyed the video and I'll catch you all another time.